The following program is a production of Truth for the World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus sextal. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. We are looking at the Lord's Supper, Gethsemane, and the trial of Jesus as we come toward a close to the life of Christ. One thing we want to emphasize as we look through these, not only this lesson, but all of them, is the example that Christ left for us. We look at the Lord's Supper. In Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 1, there's a big event that's about to take place, and that's the Passover. As it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these things, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people into the palace of the high priest, who was called Cephas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. The Passover, as you may remember from Old Testament history, was to commemorate the salvation from death by the sacrificing of the Passover lamb. The Israelites were to kill a lamb without spot or blemish, to spread its blood upon the doorposts, and by doing so, they would avoid the tenth plague of death that God brought upon the land of Egypt. The Israelites escaped that plague by sacrificing the lamb, and Christ would be our sacrificial lamb without spot, without blemish, in order to allow us the possibility to escape death that we deserve because of our sin, our rebellion against God's commandments. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 describes Jesus in that type of figure or that type of language. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Continuing in Matthew 26, starting in verse 6, we see what we might call a little foreshadowing of what's coming up. When Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And we understand by looking at different passages that it was really Judas who was upset about this because Judas held the money and he wanted to steal from it. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. Now here's the purpose of why she did it and what's coming up. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Jesus knows of his death and speaks of his death. And this woman is anointing a body much perhaps in the same way that uh, you would do when you were about to bury it. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. Now in verse 14, we understand that Judas is plotting against Jesus as well. What will you give me and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. 
And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. In other uh, accounts we read of the washing of the disciples' feet as Jesus showed his humility and servitude. But even here in other examples we see how he treats Judas. Imagine as he sits across from him, knowing full well that he will betray him, yet the honor and the respect that he still gives Judas. It doesn't say in this particular passage, I don't believe, but it, uh, the sop is mentioned in other references. And the sop, according to tradition, was considered the tastiest morsel of the meal and was often given to guests as a, as a token of honor and respect. And Jesus gave the sop to Judas, the very one who would betray him. Jesus takes the opportunity of the food that's with him and establishes what we call today the Lord's Supper. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus uses the bread as a symbol of his body, and the fruit of the vine as the symbol for his blood. They had not been shed, they had not yet been given, but Jesus knows it's coming. Jesus knows it's going to happen. And he uses these items as figures of the upcoming sacrifice. They are not literally his body and his blood, because they had not been given yet. His blood had not been shed yet. It is not alcoholic, because we know leaven or yeast was not used in the Passover meal. And yeast is what is used to make alcoholic wine. It's a simple thing, bread and grape juice. But Jesus takes these very simple items of food and says, use these as symbols for the sacrifice that I'm about to give to you. The body that I'm about to offer and the blood that I'm about to shed. As we read from the writings of Paul in 1 Corinthians we continue in the church to do this today. Paul is writing to a church in Corinth and said, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Blood was used to seal a covenant, used to seal a testament. Moses sprinkled the people with blood when they made a covenant with God. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. The Lord's Supper is used today for two things. To remember his death. But not only to remember it, the words here show means to proclaim. We proclaim the Lord's death. We teach it if you will. We evangelize it. Other people that look at us and say, what are you doing? We're showing them. This is our Savior. This is His body. This is His blood. And He died for us. We show people that through the action of partaking of the Lord's Supper. The first century church apparently did it, and we continue that practice today. After the meal, Jesus goes to what we refer to as the Garden of Gethsemane. Starting in verse 36, Jesus come with him and to a place called Gethsemane and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. He goes so far as to say, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Have you ever been so sorry you felt like you could just die? Or maybe you wished you could. I think we might be approaching the same kind of feeling that Jesus may have been feeling. My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. It must be serious if you're talking about dying. Tarry ye here and watch with me. 
And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh to the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Jesus prayed it three times, but the scripture tells us that he was using the same words, the same expressions at least, the same thoughts, the same ideas. And we could break them down to two main points. Let this cup of suffering pass from me. But the second point was, not as I will, but as thou will. The humility and the servitude of Jesus, knowing that he could have avoided this, and requesting God that he avoid this, but nevertheless submitting himself to what God wanted, rather than what he wanted. What a great example for us as we face challenges seemingly far less stressful and and agonizing in the world today, but yet we sometimes do not want to bend our will to what God wants. Mark's account of this time lets us know that the disciples didn't know what to say to him. We don't have a lot of recording here that the disciples responded, but uh, Mark records, neither wist they what to answer him. What, what, what do we say? They're falling asleep. They're falling asleep. They're not giving him perhaps the company and the comfort that they want, but apparently they were affected by the sorrow of Jesus because Luke records in verses 39 through 46 that they were affected. Now, keep in mind that Luke is a physician. He's a doctor by trade. So sometimes the style of Luke's writing comes out with a little bit more detail about physical things than you'll find in other other writings of the gospel because Luke is a doctor and he notices these things and he knows these things. Luke says in Luke 22, starting in verse 39, He came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And he was at the place, he said to them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Jesus was exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. And an angel strengthens him. Luke goes so far as to say, as being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. How was he praying? In agony. He was already in agony. He was in agony before he even got to the cross. And he was praying earnestly. And now Luke describes his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said to them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Look again at verse 44. Jesus' sweat was as great drops of blood. Strange description. Why would Luke write that? Well, some claim Jesus was merely sweating. Well, that seems kind of illogical to me because... Sweat and blood are both liquids that drip from the body. 
If Jesus was merely sweating, why did Luke the physician not simply say his sweat was as it were great drops of sweat falling to the ground? Instead, Luke used what we call a simile, where you compare two things using like or as. If Luke was merely describing one thing, sweat, it doesn't seem logical to me to describe it with a simile of something else that falls to the ground in the same way. Sweat drops in drops and blood drops in drops. If that's the comparison you're making, that's not a very good comparison. That's not a strong reason for a comparison, but Luke describes the sweat as blood, and now we have a comparison of something different between sweat and blood, and that's color. Sweat is clear, but blood is red. I believe the logical conclusion is that Jesus was under so much sorrow. He was in so much agony He was sorrowful unto death, as he put it, that he might have been suffering from hematohydrosis syndrome. I did a little bit of research and found this article from the National Institute of Health, National Institutes of Health. Really, it's from the Canadian Journal of Medicine. I won't read the whole thing to you, but there are cases of this occurring. And what's really interesting is that it says all experience transient but recurring bloody sweat. All were tested to confirm the presence of blood as opposed to chemical discoloration and to rule out bleeding disorders. In other words, from all these cases they examined, people were sweating blood. Now, is this some kind of blood disorder, blood disease? What causes this? Well... The, di- the, the answer may be different for different people, but at least 15, 54% of the cases had suffered severe psychological stress, either with mental illness such as depression or anxiety or in the post-traumatic setting, having witnessed violence at home, school, or beyond. Trauma, psychological stress can literally cause people to sweat blood crazy, but it's true. There's multiple medical cases of this happening. Now, can I prove that that's what's going on with Jesus? Maybe not. But it certainly seems to all add up. And Luke, being a physician, I think would understand the difference between sweat and blood. And when he described Jesus, he said his drops of sweat were coming out like blood. Why did the disciples not watch with him? Luke describes the disciples as sleeping for sorrow. Apparently the agony and the exceeding sorrow that Jesus was going through did influence his disciples because they were sorrowful too. As a matter of fact, Luke describes that's why they fell asleep, for sorrow. I don't know how else to describe it except in modern terms we would say they cried themselves to sleep. And now Jesus is betrayed. The trial. I should have put that in quotes, but I didn't think of it until just now. Starting in verse 47. While he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him from a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priest, remember that, chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? How then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Jesus is arrested. 
He does not resist. He claims that he can bring thousands and thousands of angels to his defense. But he chooses not to. Continuing in verse 57, They that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Cephas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off into the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. And said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered, said, He is guilty of death. From my understanding, from what I've read, there are several things about the trial of Jesus that made it an improper conviction. And it shows just how hardened of the heart these people were because they were, if I may use the pun, dead set on getting rid of Jesus. First, the testimony of witnesses were false and they did not concur. They didn't agree. If we look over to the description that Mark gives, many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. They couldn't even get their false story straight. But yet Jesus was convicted. He goes on to say, Neither so did their witness agree together. Another reason that it was an improper conviction is that the testimony of witnesses misquoted Jesus. I believe if you look a little closer, they didn't even quote Jesus correctly in the false, witnesses that they, uh, false witness that they gave. Matthew says, one witness said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Mark says that a witness said, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands and within three days, I will build another made without hands. But notice what Jesus actually said in John chapter 2 and 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Was he talking about a temple made with hands? Was he talking about the temple of God? He was talking about his own body. Capital trials, which we talk about capital punishment, life and death, capital trials were not supposed to be held at night. Yet that's exactly when they did this. And now the thing I've been telling you to keep in mind, who was seeking Jesus? Who was plotting to kill him? The chief priests. Guess who was the judge? The chief priests. In other words, you've got a chief priest who's working both as judge and for the prosecution at the same time. How would you like to be in a trial like that today? where the judge is also collaborating with the prosecution against you. It's hopeless. It's hopeless. The trial is, as we would call, a kangaroo court. It's a mockery. There's no point in even doing it. It's all just formality to proclaim what you've already decided before the trial even began. Matthew twenty six fifty nine. the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. That's the judge doing that. The judge is trying to get witnesses against you. Are you going to have a fair trial? Not at all. The witnesses should have prompted the trial. But in this case, the arrest was made and then they looked for witnesses. Normally you arrest somebody after somebody files a complaint. In this case, they arrested him and then they went to try to find people to complain against him. Notice again, the chief priest, this is after Jesus is arrested. They sought false witnesses, but they found none. 
Though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. And at the last came two false witnesses. This is after the arrest. They're still looking for witnesses. Also in capital cases, judgment was supposed to be delayed until the next day. Now we may not do that in our modern society, but in that particular time, if you're deciding the man's life or death, you don't give your decision and render it until the next day. But this is the way it was. You don't render judgment until the next day. What did they do in verse 66? What think you? Give me your judgment. And they said he's guilty of death. Guilty. We're not waiting until tomorrow. Let's do it now. There may have been another reason for that. And that could be because there was not supposed to be a capital trial on Friday to begin with. And the reason for that is because the judgment would have to take place the next day, which is a Sabbath. And convening the council on the Sabbath was forbidden. They they obviously didn't care about that enough. They said, we want to kill him, and we want to kill him now. They weren't even supposed to be having a trial like this on Friday, but they did. They weren't supposed to be having it at night, but they did. The chief priest was working for the prosecution, who's the judge and the prosecution. It's one of the worst trials that I know of ever recorded in history. It's not even worthy to be called a trial. That's why I said it should have been put in quotes, but I didn't think of it. It's a trial, quote unquote. And then finally, once Jesus provided his testimony, the call for judgment was made. The testimony of Jesus was not even explored to see whether or not it was true. As soon as Jesus said, I am the Christ, the Messiah, they said, that's it, you're guilty. What about the evidence? What about the miracles that he did to prove that what he said was true? Nicodemus knew that. He said in John chapter 3, no man can do the things you do unless God is with him. Where was that testimony? Why didn't they bring in some testimony for him? Why didn't they talk about the miracles and the evidence? Oh, they didn't care about that stuff. As soon as he said something, they could hang on him as alleged blasphemy. That was it. They're done. There's even more things that are wrong, but we're not going into all of the list. This is certainly sufficient to see that the Pharisees and the Jews, some of them at least, were so bent on killing Jesus, they didn't really care what laws and what rules and what ethics they violated. They just wanted Jesus dead. Kind of makes me think back on the previous lesson we had on the destruction of Jerusalem. What what condemnation would God have on the Jewish nation who did this to his son? Just like that parable that Jesus said, right? He lent out the, the vineyard to the husbandman. They beat his servants. And then finally he said, I'll send them my son, they'll respect my son. But they said, let's kill him. What will the master do to those people? And the obvious answer was, he will miserably destroy those people. What would God do to the Jewish nation who did this to his son and murdered the prophets? Why was Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. And now they're going to kill him. In a few years in A.D. 70, God would bring judgment upon the Jewish nation. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org.